Okay. Now, I'm going to quickly take you through the content for this week and then discuss a few things with you. Now, what you will see, uh, the content which we will be covering is the section unit two on use case analysis. Um, we will be looking at unit one and unit two for now. Okay. Now, unit one covers the development of a use case utilization. Now, there is some information, there's a walkthrough, there's a video also in here, and the presentation with the lesson plan, which you can go through. Okay. And the same for unit two, uh, module two, on finding analysis classes. There's a presentation on it with its walkthrough, and so there's a bit more work in that section. But let's quickly go through this and very briefly look at this. Now, this takes you through the objectives of use case analysis, which is really then a matter of it. And then there's a mention about the use case analysis overview, what is the inputs, what is the outputs, and what are we going to achieve from this? Okay. So main things which we're gonna get out of this is our use case utilizations and an analysis model and our analysis classes. What we have done so far is not well enough yet to go and develop the system with. We've not really identified classes for it or even operations and objects and attributes. Okay, so we will be focusing on these three or getting to them in this case. Okay. So there's a bit of an overview of use case analysis steps. We will be covering the first three of them now which is to create an analysis use case utilization, then to supplement the description, brief description, briefly and finding analysis classes from their behavior. So there's also mention about the goal. It's really to take our current understanding of the requirements into the use cases and iteratively to transform those requirements into some representation that supports the business concepts, the business goals and requirements. Okay. So they also mentioned about the purpose of this, to identify the classes which perform the flow of events for the use case, to ultimately to distribute our behavior our operations to some of the classes using use case realizations, then to identify the responsibilities, attributes, and associations for classes later on at that. Then to note the usage of architectural mechanisms. Okay. But if we for, before we get to that, as they mentioned about supplementing the use case description, and they give us two examples by the first one saying, the system displays a list of course offerings is that detail enough to say to us who's displaying it, who's doing it, and what's being done? In one sense, no. If we compare it to the one there on the right, the system retrieves and displays a list of current course offerings from the course catalog legacy database. So it's telling us what is it getting from where, what is it doing, how is it doing it, a bit more information and detail. So that's what we mean by supplement the use case description. Okay. Now what we have to note is that sometimes when you supplement, you might go and inadvertently change the um, requirements a bit. Okay. Why? Because we now add new things to it. We, the scope grows a bit. You do something and it, it's doing different things. So if you are not careful, you might see that these will be changes in the flow of your use case. Okay. Or you can add and delete steps from your flow events. And if it's done properly, uh, the focus will be on enhancing the current flow of internal details. So what we're more aiming for is to only enhance that and say what is being done in a bit more detail. Okay. 
So then they mentioned the thing about developing a use case realization. Now, let me quickly just show you what is a realization and what, what it tells us. A realization looks ultimately like this. We have our requirements use case on the left and our analysis one on the right. But what it tells me later on is I will start to add classes to this and this create profile analysis one will start to expand. This guy will become bigger. Because it will tell me almost I need five classes or I need these guys to participate to allow me to perform this behavior. Okay. So ultimately it looks something like this. We might have the actor the rest of our class is saying to us, I need these guys to work together to realize and to perform ultimately the behavior which is required in my requirements use case. So that's why you will see really, this means to us that we are transitioning from requirements to analysis um, and it really performs as a bridge for now. It allows us to trace back the classes and our behavior to our actual requirements. But you don't come up with something which is not required. Okay. So it really is there for the traceability from your analysis and design section to your initial requirements, your initial documentation. Okay, so it helps us organize our collaborations in the analysis and design model around our use case to say but these classes which I have here ultimately allow me to perform the behavior for a specific use case. That's where we're going. So to create this what we mainly are seeing is we have a ellipse still representing the requirements use case but then we have a dotted line with a closed arrow pointing towards it and a dotted ellipse for the analysis one. Okay. So then there's also an example of the different notations between when you do it in the software and when you do it by hand. Okay. So if we are creating a use case realization those classes that we see in the actual we, that we saw in the final one there how do we get to see them? By creating and ultimately using the class diagram and our interaction diagrams. So we might use our class diagram and the, the sequence diagram and they will help us to expand the number of classes which we have for that use case. Okay. So the sequence diagram really tells us the sequence in which we are communicating between classes and the class diagram gives us the, a structural diagram between the classes to tell us what is the relationship between classes. Okay. Guys, any questions so far? Why do we do a use case realization? Ultimately, the realization helps us to say, but the classes which we have here is traceable and linked back to a original use case, to some original requirement. If you develop a system for someone and you are just doing that without linking it back to some original requirement, some original document, what is your chances of having your final thing successful? Slim. Really slim sometimes because what we are doing here is not always traceable back to some actual requirement. So what we are seeing, this is merely helps us with the traceability and the transformation from the actual requirements to the analysis and design. Okay. 
Now, guys, the second portion of this is, is really about no matter of finding the analysis clauses. What is an analysis clause? What is a clause, quickly? Class and programming provides a structure to us and where we ultimately are going is the following is to say but what are the uh, my use cases we are merely moving to executable code okay so my use case in terms of the specification, the document, we will translate that to our analysis classes. And the analysis classes will later on be translated to some design element, to some design class, which can be converted to your source code and executable ultimately to give you the final system. So for class, what are we seeing? It's really some abstraction of a real world item which is described uh, a common or a group of objects with some common shared behavior. Now what we see from this is we have a professor class. It has place for the professor, the, the class name, then the attributes and also the operations. Okay, what is attributes? Attribute is almost just like a plain variable which describes some aspect of that class or an instance of that class later on. Now the operations can be the things which it ultimately will be allowed to do to perform. Okay. Now why do we find these analysis classes? It tells us the, to identify a candidate set of model elements for uh, really analysis classes which are capable of performing the behavior which is described by my use case. So it's really taking a matter of finding now classes which can perform the behavior which I stated, which I wrote in my document, in my specification. Okay. Also, what you will see from this is really, and our, our analysis classes is really a first pass at the actual classes. There's a mention about w what is some guidelines to finding classes, but we'll look more in terms of this now. Okay, so from our use case specification, the actual document, we can find different types of classes. We can start to say, but I have my use case specification, I can have a boundary class. I can have a control class or entity. Again, there's two more symbols noted there. Okay, then they just annotated it for us. What is a boundary class? Who would like to take a guess? I think the okay, who is a user? A user can be considered a human, okay? But what other types of actors do we have? Another system, some hardware device. So they can use either a system boundary in terms of a API or a device interface, that hardware system or the system to interact with our system. But what will a user use to interact with a system? A user might use some graphic user interface, a button or some actual event to interact with it. Okay, what is the purpose of this control class? It's there to act as a use case behavior coordinator. Okay. It's there to manage your use case and the, the sequence of events which we will see from it. Okay. Now your entity 
classes captures the system information, the thing, the data that must be stored for later use. So then there's also mention about a stereotype. What is a common stereotype here at university? It's hmm? Do we have common stereotypes? What is the stereotype? The racial one we a lot of in South Africa see is black and white and colored, all of that. You might see that also. What others? Hmm? Some of the examples I talk about jocks. What's a jock? Who's a jock? A party animal. Hmm? Who's a party animal? Ah. Okay. <laughs> So, by looking at it, we are stereotyping someone. We're saying, but you are like this. Now, what we are going to be looking at is we are also going to use the same thing and say, but this class which I have here is fulfilling the, this type of role. Is that what we're doing with human stereotypes? You're acting like a baboon. So now people call you a baboon. Okay, similar to that. Okay, so we are going to look at different types of uh, analysis classes and the, the three main ones which we will see will allow us to um, interact with the actor and the system. That will be our boundary class between that will allow the transition between the actual boundary of the system and the actor and then we might see the information the system uses. What is that? The entity class. Then we also have our control logic of the system to capture the control class. Okay. So then they get to a place where they say to us, but there is some guidelines to develop a boundary class now to identify them. The basic guideline, they go forth and say, one boundary class per actor use case P. If we have an actor and they are communicating with a use case and we have a communication association going, then it means that they must have some form. Okay. So based on the fact that we might have several different types of actors, we can also have different types of boundary classes. So looking at there's a bit of an example where they discuss a bit more. Okay. But what we might, we might see is that when we are identifying a boundary class for actors, am I going to now start to already focus on the type of buttons, the, the programming language? No. I'm more going to focus on what information must be presented. Okay. I'm not going to focus on the implementation language yet. The same as when we're looking at system and device interfaces, we are only going to co concentrate on what protocol must be used. We're not going to say, but how is this implemented? What are we really using? Okay. So there's a matter also about when we name and identify boundary classes, you will see if I have a um, actor, what am I going to name this boundary clause which he is going to act with? I'm going to take the use case name and I'm going to add form to the end of it. So if we add like authenticate and the guy needs to authenticate, what will we call this? <coughs> authenticate form. Now, if we have a system interface or a device interface. We add the interface to the end of the external system's name or the device name. So as an example, what we're we seeing, we might have a prospective student who's creating a profile, but he is ultimately using some form because he's a user. 
over there, I have send email and the email server system. That system is another system outside the scope of ours. So what we are seeing is we might have email server system interface, which ultimately will result into some API or program call which we were forming. Okay. Any questions so far, guys? So what role does the boundary clause play? Boundary clause is the clause which the user will use to interact with our system. It may either be a form or a device interface or a systems interface. Okay. Then there's a mention quickly about discovering control classes. Now a control class is there to capture our use case behavior, which is a behavior coordinator. Now, if we have more complex logic in a use case, then we might have more control classes. But generally, the rule says to have one control class per use case or use case utilization. Now, how do we name this guy? Okay. Says to us, yeah, we add controller to the end of the use cases name. So basically, if I name this guy, I, let's say we're again talking about authenticate, I would call it authenticate controller because my main use case still stays authenticate. I might have need to have a controller for this guy, and I'll call it in authenticate controller. If we look at that example. We have two use cases, uh, create profile and send email. From the, for each use case, I will have a control clause. Okay. Create profile controller and send email controller. So allowing us to separate a bit of this functionality. Okay. Why do we have a control clause? It manages this interaction between the classes, the boundary class and later on your entity class and so on. We'll look at a bit now in more detail. Okay, so then they talk a bit about the entity class and the roles which they have. For the entity class, uh, it says to us that it's capturing the key abstractions of the system. It comes from my use case or architectural analysis abstraction, the glossary business domain model, but it is also environment independent. Okay. And it's stereotyped there, as indicated there. So, why are they important? Why is an entity class important? It tells us they, that they provide another point of view from which to understand the system, because they show the logical data structure, and knowing the data structure can help you understand what the system is actually doing. Okay, so it's more focused on the actual classes and the data which we're going to store than what the behavior will be or the user interface. Okay. So when we're trying to look for entity classes, some of the sources to this might be my glossary or business domain model or my use case specification. So when we're going through this, I'm going to start looking for noun or noun phrases. Okay. And my nouns can either become an entity class, attributes of a class, or they might not have any significance for my actual use case. What is an, an example of a noun? What's an example of a noun? Yes. So it can be table, chair, 
-hmm. person. Okay. If we would like to create a class to capture student information, what information will be added in there? What, what is it going to store? Possibly the date of birth, his, his name, his surname, his ID number. Those are attributes which describes ultimately the student. So there's a mention about the technique which we use to do this. It's called grammatical dissection or noun extraction, where we go through our documents and especially the use case specification. We find the nouns and we list them. Okay. Now, sometimes we might need to remove redundant candidates. Why redundant? Because a lot of times you might have already identified so it doesn't help that you read student and every time that you see student in this paragraph, you can highlight it. Your page is going to be full of red marks. Or vague candidates. Words which describe things which is a bit vague and not clear. Okay. Actors which is possibly outside of the scope. I'll come back to you now. Actors which is outside the scope of our system. There's no problem about storing data which looks like an actor, but not the actual actor that we might also have. Okay. Or implementation constructs, attributes, or operations. We had a question now. What names? No. Now keep in mind that we are designing the system. Um, let's say, for example, if we had to develop the the ATM's use case to authenticate the person, and you are now the analyst or engineer working on that section you would start looking through the documentation and you would start to read through the specifications and every time that you might find a noun which will store some data which is relevant to your use case you will highlight it now what happens a lot of times is you might find redundant candidates because you've already identified them five times so you're not gonna highlight them anymore okay. So that's a lot of times what happens um, through this whole process. Now there is a bit of a, a recap about what is nouns, common nouns, your proper nouns, concrete, abstract, and collective nouns. Okay. From this, I just want to mention quickly, common nouns is the one which we see a lot of times um, where we refer to uh, people or things in general terms. Okay, so there we can talk about a human or, or person. Proper noun is a name that identifies a particular person. This we won't see so much. Then concrete nouns is a noun which refers to people and to things that exist physically and can be seen, um, smelled, heard, or tasted. Okay, then there's abstract nouns. Uh, abstract noun is a noun which refers to ideas, qualities, and conditions. When you design a system, the number of orders, or the login date and time, it's not really a concrete noun or a uh, or so. That more falls under the concept of abstract nouns. Okay, it's still ideas or qualities or some condition the date you've registered okay the fact that you are registered okay the subject which you have registered for okay guys so there is a basic exercise where we can start to identify the nouns from this 
uh, where we have like the create profile. And from this, we can start to identify different things. Now, we can say selected to create a profile, the prospective student select the create profile option on the student registration system. What would be nouns there? Is this prospective student a noun? That's a person, so it can be considered a noun. Create profile option on the SRS scene. Is that nouns? Let me do this a bit better. Display country code option. Is there any nouns there? We can go and say country code. The system displays on the screen the country code option to the student to allow the student to enter the South African country code. So from this we can identify some nouns. But where is this going? Let's quickly look at the rest. Okay, so one of the problems when we identify nouns, so there is some pitfalls mentioned here, uh, is several of our terms may refer to the same object. Because we might identify s nouns which is similar, they identify to, really to the same concept of thing. And then one term may refer to more than one object or multiple terms. Then one of the problems which we a lot of times see is our natural language is very ambiguous and is not clear always. Okay? Any noun can be disguised as a verb and a verb can be disguised as a noun. But this whole process is dependent on your writing skills. How was the specification written? Okay, then there's a mention about should we capture actors as entities. Okay. Now, wh wh when will we see an actor become an entity? An entity is going to be used to capture information for us and it will be later on stored in some form of a database. It can either be in a flat file where every row represents a record which we keep or it can go into a actual database for you. Now, when are we going to have an, an actor as an entity? Okay, if there's a need to model information about that actor inside the system. Okay, you are a student here at the university. Does ITS need to know and store information about you? You are a student, and if you would like to perform the use case on reviewing your marks, does ITS need to know information about you? Yes. Who says yes, ITS? The system which we would like to design, if we wanted to design this guy, does that guy need to know information about you? Does it need to store data about you inside the system? Yes. Okay, so that is where this question is going about when will an actor become an 
uh, an entity class and modeled like that inside our system. Okay, so that's why they said to us, if there is a need to model information about that actor, then it will be modeled and placed inside the system and restored in some form of a database. Okay, or if it's not the same as modeling the actual actor, we merely stating data will be, which will be stored about this actor inside the system. Now, actors by the definition is external to the system. We are not capturing that actor inside the system. We're capturing data about the actor inside the system. Okay, so then there's a mention about how do we perform grammatical dissection. Okay, so what we will be doing is we will be taking all the nouns which we've identified, list them in a small table, and we're going to ask, answer a few questions to this. And the questions which we might look at is, for example, is this noun which I've discovered inside my system boundary? Is this noun an entity? Or does it conform to the definition of an entity? Is it a person, a place, an object, or a concept, or an event about which organization wishes to maintain some form of data? That, and third and fourth question, does this candidate have, have identifiable behavior for our problem domain? And does this candidate have relationship with other candidate nouns? So those are really the four questions which we're looking at. So the table looks something like that. You might have your use case name or you might, you're going to have your noun name. And then you start to answer, is this candidate inside our system boundary? Yes or no? Okay. Now, if you've completed that, you will start to see, but yes, this noun which I have here will ultimately become a class in my system, which I'm designing. Okay. If we are working with that student inside the reviewing of marks for ITS and whatever all of that, would you say that it, it will be inside our system? Will the system want to store data about the student? Possibly. So what are we saying? We need to say, yes, we might want to store some data about it. Then the second question, does it conform to the, the definition of an entity. Is it a person, a place, a concept, object, or event about which we want to store data? In this case, yes. If I have two others there which I possibly discovered like date, name, would you say that date possibly is inside the system boundary? Yes. It might be yes. The name, yes. Does, does it conform to the definition of an entity? Is date a person, a place, an object, or a concept, or an event about which we want to store some data? It becomes very difficult. Okay. Okay. Date by itself won't become a class. It will possibly become an attribute inside a class. Okay. Name. Is it a person? Is it a place? Is it a concept, object, or an event about which we want to store data? Okay, I'll play along for now and say yes. Okay, so guys, 
Then there's two other questions which is left, looking at the behavior and looking at the collaboration. So, so from this, we've answered only the first two questions. You will see there's another presentation which takes us through the matter of identifying if this candidate which we have so far, is it really a class? If we take, for example, the name and the student, we start to look at them. We can from there then start to see. But does it have behavior? Behavior meaning is, it, is there things which we need to do? Is it things which we need to know from it? Okay. If we are talking about the student, I can break it down into responsibilities on the left hand side and collaborations on the right hand side. Responsibilities being either doing things as in behavior or knowing things as in attributes. If we look at our student is there information we would like to know about the student for their marks? If you look at ITS, what do you see for your marks? We review your marks. Do you see some student information? You might see your name. The student number. ID number, there's a lot of other things which ultimately is referring to attributes. This, the knowing portion is attributes. Okay, from where you can identify this? A lot of times from the use case specification. Okay. Then, if I look at the collaboration or even the operations, firstly, let's look at that. Is there things which the student might need to do? What? Okay, so we might need to check the financial status. Check financial status. What else? Cancel a subject. <laughs> okay, now, if I want to visit you, what do I need to do? I by myself don't know where you are staying. I don't know what your telephone number is, I can't phone you. I need to speak to you and say to you, hey, I want to come and visit you. Where do you stay? What's your number? Okay? A lot of times we have the same for systems. If I want to check your financial status, does the student class by itself know everything? No. Otherwise, we are going to have this big fat class sitting there and trying to do everything. Okay? What is the student class supposed to know? Only information which is relevant about the student. There might be some financial class sitting there or subject class sitting there which keeps a bit more information. Okay. So if I want to check the financial status, what do I need to do? I need to go and collaborate. I'm 
now calling it finance class for lack of a better name, better name. If I want to remove a subject, does the student class by itself know all of his subjects he's doing? Student class only knows his, your name, your student number, your ID number, your telephone, that type of information. It doesn't know the subject. So one of the things I need to do is I need to contact hey, the actual subject. Okay. So by what we've done so far is we've identified the responsibilities by giving this class really reason for being there. Okay. So this is almost like giving it a backbone and reason for being there. It's also giving it collaborations. So if we go back to this, I can now go and say, hey, my student class, yes, it has behavior. And it is collaborating with another class. If I now have four yeses here, I can go and say, yes, you are going to become a class in my system. But what happens if there's one where it's not yes? Like take, for example, date. Is date going to become a class in the system? Which we want to store data by? No, it is not going to become a class. So if I had to go and create a date class, my question a lot of times is what will be the attributes of this thing? Can I break this thing smaller? Can I give it attributes? Can I give date meaningful attributes? With trying, without trying to dissect it and breaking it into Monday, Tuesday, things like that. It doesn't really become meaningful. Okay, so date by itself won't probably become a class. Even if you look at your name, What attributes can you tell me about your name? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it becomes difficult because we can't break it really down small. It's a bit pointless. Okay. okay. So coming back to this, is that once we've answered all four of those questions, we can say all four of them are yes, then it's going to be come across. If there's one for which it's no, it's not going to become a class. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Yes. So if we, for example, go back to this and say, That's why I'm saying is that for, let's say we tried doing the, the CRC code or that small table for the date. I can't really give the date more attributes or actual correct attributes. Then I would say, no, you are not a class. But I've already answered question one, yes. But does it make a class? No. So even for name, I can't give name proper stuff. I can't give name proper stuff. So if I had to go and create a CRC code for name what will be the responsibilities of name? Can you break it down into first name, last name, initials? No. Okay, so that's what I'm saying is if we now take it back to this, then it might be easy to say yes, but I can't give it proper 
responsibilities. I also can't give it proper collaboration because with what is name collaborating, it becomes difficult. And then I can just say, uh, you are not a class. You are possibly an attribute of a class. Okay. So that's a lot of times what you will see is you will see, you might discover a lot of nouns, but only a few of them will become your true entity classes. The things about which we were storing data. We used to store data, but the rest will probably become attributes of those classes. Or they have no importance. Okay. Okay. 